we'll try this maybe a little bit later. Okay, so we're gonna dive into Node today. We are gonna get interrupted with our lockdown and fire drill. We'll do as much as we can. I do have a lab plan for you, which may have to get pushed to next week, depending on how far we're able to get. Um, a quick link here, I would suggest you have a, a, a full read through of this article. Why the hell would I use Node.js? Um, I just wanna hit on a couple of the important points. I'm not gonna read it to you. You can read it on your own. Um, the reason I like this is it sort of describes the benefits of Node. So again, here he's quoting Ryan Dahl, who was quoted in you know, the video that we watched in week one, explaining basically where Node is a good fit. So the idea again was all about non-blocking event-driven code. So for example, um, push anything with push notifications where we want our application to constantly be able to do things even with no interaction from the user node is a good candidate so anything where we're looking at for example real-time two-way communication so something like chat is a really good fit for a node application um, so he discusses one of the important points is that node is not should not be used for everything. It has its uses, it has its fits that it works really well for, and there's many types of web applications where Node isn't a good fit. So he's trying to kind of describe the difference between the two. And this is kind of where Node is good, okay? Where speed is critical and where the ability to scale our applications is also critical. So something like a mobile app or mobile app based on web technologies, Node is a great fit. We build something, we don't know what kind of user base we're gonna get, but potentially our application could be big. Well, if we build it with Node and host it in the cloud, the ability to scale up more resources, if it's used a lot, is really, uh, is highly available. Okay. They sort of describe how, you know, we sort of looked at this over the last couple weeks. So here's the traditional model of request, sorry, request and response whereas Node can handle all of these requests on one thread on the processor. Um, we're gonna talk about Package Manager a little bit later. Um, the Node Package Manager in a nutshell, if you think back to how we used Visual, in Visual Studio, we used some support libraries that Microsoft provided when we did things like authentication and error handling. In Visual Studio, we had a package manager and we could just import or add a package or add a library to our code. Well, Node is the same. In fact, we'll look at the Node Packager a lot more. We'll look at some of the, using some of these packages like Mongo and Express over the next few weeks. So he's also given some examples of where Node might be really good. So something like a chat application works well. He's kind of mapped out how this all works. We've got a single event loop running that just handles mess processing messages back and forth. Node is also great for doing API development. We played around with APIs just a little bit in our other couple courses. Can you think about why Node is such a good fit for building APIs? JavaScript JSON? Yeah, because JSON is the standard language for APIs. Node's all written in JavaScript, so it serializes. We can read and write JSON super easily with Node. So it fits fits really well. So if we want to do something like stream audio and video, again, Node is going to be a good choice for that. So we make some other recommendations. So server-side web applications, single-page web apps. Now here's what you don't find typically. They've also described where we should avoid Node. And this is probably the biggest one, where we have a large, complex relational database, we can use Node, but it's really not designed for this. If I was going to rebuild Amazon.com, I wouldn't use Node. Okay? The size and scale and complexity of it um, is not a great fit. Could you do it? Yes. Can we build a Node application with a relational database like MySQL or SQL Server on the back end? Yes, we can. It's not really designed for that. So it's designed when our data is relatively simple, where we don't have a lot of different tables and we don't have a lot of complicated relationships. Okay? And that'll become a bit more clear when we look at NoSQL databases. Okay. Um, 
Also where we have to do heavy number crunching, again, it's really not designed for this. Um, and he go, goes in to explain why. So if we're doing something with, say, data analytics or advanced searching and reporting, Node's probably not a good choice for the reasons that he explains here. Um, so we really have to think about what we're building. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Some of you, some people, they find Node, they really love it, and they decide I'm going to use Node for everything. It has its uses, and a lot of the stuff we do are good candidates for Node applications. But again, think of it as it's nimble, it's light, it's fast, so it should be used for applications that kind of match that description. For large, massive, complicated enterprise-level applications, it's probably not a great choice. But for many of the things we do, it is a really good fit because those applications tend to be small and simple. Okay. So you, can, you may want to read through some of the details on your own time. And there are lots of comments here so, um, by some very informed developers who have some other opinions. But I think this gives a pretty good background sort of about what Node is and where we use it and what it's not and what it isn't particularly well suited for. Okay. So that's the first link in week three. Um, that I would suggest you have a read through. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, so we want to talk about the whole stack, today we're dealing with the end part of this, but giving you an overview of kind of where we're going. Um, I'm not going to read all this stuff. I'm just going to touch on what's important. And we can maybe also, as we go through this, play around with some of the code in the command line as we're doing this. Okay. So I think by now, probably you're familiar with what the components of the mean stack are. So this week, we'll deal with Node. Next week, assuming we get to do everything I want to do with Node, next week, we'll look at Express which is a framework that we're going to use from every class on after next week. We'll use Express. It's a framework that sits on top of Node because Node is not specific to, doing web, to building web applications. We can build it. You know, we can build network services just to get computers to talk to each other. So Express is a web framework that jet basically gives us the web server infrastructure we need. It handles things like HTTP requests and responses. So we'll do that and Express will kind of build out a lot of things for us. There's, there's a templating engine with Express that it will build out an application shell, which we'll use. Then in uh, weeks five and six, we'll play around with MongoDB, which is a NoSQL database, so we'll add that part. So by the time we get to reading week, we'll be able to do create, read, update, and delete applications using Node, Express, and Mongo. That's kind of where we're going over the next four classes. We should have those full, a full working CRUD application done before reading week. And then the last piece, which is the most complicated, will be Angular, which I think we talked about a few weeks ago. A few of you got to play around with a little bit on co-op. Right? So Angular helps us build dynamic front ends really easily. Well, not really easily, but really powerfully and really fast. And the idea is we're basically using JavaScript all the way through the stack. JavaScript in the database, JavaScript in the front end, JavaScript in the back end. So um, the idea of using this framework, particularly the Express, is we want to divide our applications up into logical tiers. I think we may have talked about this a bit in the past. We may have talked about it a little bit when we were doing ASP.NET applications. We want to break our application into a data section, a logic section, and a presentation section. Why? This is sort of typically how applications, almost regardless of language or framework, they're kind of broken down into this way. What are some of the reasons we would do it? If you think in a PHP application, all this stuff is typically all just together. PHP file handles the data, <laughs> does the logic, and it renders the presentation. Well, even I think like it's just any basic web application usually from, uh, in the first term they explain that first uh, let's say JavaScript would be the, 
there would be functionality, there would be the structure, and then there would be um, kind of like some, some additional stuff which might be like JavaScript. So it just makes it more efficient and easier for you to modify and to view it and to create it. Okay, yeah, you know, it's similar. It's a similar idea here that it, it makes it, why does it make it easier for us to create it and modify it if we build out these pieces separately? Why is it easier? Or how does it make it easier? So, like, if you're working in a group or something, like, these people can, like, every, each and every department in one environment, like... Yeah, rather than working in one set of files, if we have three people on the team, someone can do all of the data, all the files related to dealing with the database. Someone can else, we can have a front end person do all of the user interface, and we can have somebody doing the logic. So by breaking, so it's easy for us to divide the labor. These things will live in separate physical files, so we're not working on the same files together. It also means we can test these things easily, and we can also reuse the code easily because it's all modular, split into components rather than in separate files. So the structure that we use for this is the com most common pattern is MVC or Model View Controller. So Model View Controller is a, a pattern or a style of programming. It's not particular to any one language. You know, we can build MVC applications in PHP although there aren't many tools out there for doing it. We can certainly build them in C-sharp, and the structure we're going to use with the mean stack is we're going to follow this MVC pattern. Has anybody worked with any MVC frameworks or used this architecture before? Is it new for pretty much everybody? Yeah. You've used it with which tech, what technology? <laughs> Yeah, well, there is a PHP framework, which some developers really like. So our MVC, the model view and controller, what the model does is it basically deals with our database. So if we have three tables in the database, we're probably going to have three model files in our application, each one representing and interacting with that table. The views are pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> the views are the pages, the front end that will contain HTML as well as some way of displaying server-side values. Could be Angular, could be with server-side code. And the controller sits in the middle. The controller is the logic piece. So it looks something like this. This is the way an MVC app runs. Right? So let's say I want to click on, let's say we're on Facebook. I don't know whether they use an MVC architecture or not, but if we were to build something, an app like Facebook, and use this pattern here, how, here's how it would work. So I want to, I click on someone's profile. So I'm making a request, and the controller is going to interpret that URL, like facebook.com slash Martin Pennock, right? I want to see Martin's profile. So the controller interprets that URL and decides what to do with that URL. Well, it will interpret based on the URL request that what I want to see is Martin's profile. So then it's going to talk to the profile model and run some kind of query and pass in the information about what profile I want to see. The model interacts with my database, pulls out that data. Then the model has to hand the data back to the view, which is what the user sees. Okay. So this is the logic. This is the file that's interacting with the database doing create, read, update, and delete on a particular table. And the view is the HTML file or, well, or is the file with, could have different types of extensions, but ultimately that's going to contain both the HTML as well as our dynamic content. Or let's say we want to register for something, we want to fill out a sign up form. So I fill out a form and I hit post. The controller will interpret the URL. It will also know that I submitted a post request. So now when I submit a post request, it's going to call the create or save method in my model, which creates something in the database. And then it will determine what page gets rendered back to me. In many cases, I might just render the same page back, hide the form, and show a message instead. Um, so really, Using the mean stack, we're going to be following using those four JavaScript technologies and using this pattern of model view and controller together. 
So here's kind of all the pieces of how the mean stack works. So Angular is a front-end framework. So it's JavaScript on the front end, but it has access to our server-side values. So we can dynamically change things. For example, we have a shopping cart. We're on the check it, we're on our cart page. We can see all the items in our cart, how the quantity of each and the price. If we want to update the price, rather than doing a full post to the server to update everything, we can use Angular to do that update right in the front end. It's very fast. Our full, a full page refresh doesn't have to happen, and we don't need to use Ajax to do it. We can just update part of the page. So the node server sits in the middle. So node basically is handling requests from our client and responses coming back. And express sits between Node and our MongoDB. It makes requests to the database and sends data back. So our application is kind of constantly going in this loop, back and forth between client and browser. So we go from Angular to Node to Express to Mongo. So we don't need to use Express. We don't need to use Angular. We could just build an application that's straight Node and Mongo. The benefit of Express is it basically pre-writes a lot of the web handling code for us. So we don't need it, but it saves us a lot of time. Or we could just use these three pieces. And that's what we'll do over the next four or five classes. We won't involve Angular at all. We're just going to build an application using Node, Express, and Mongo and get that up and running. And we'll add the Angular piece on later. So we already kind of covered some of this stuff that where Node came from, that it's event driven, and that we want to ex execute asynchronous code, which we did a couple weeks ago. Remember, we did two versions of reading our text file. We did the blocking version and we did the non-blocking version and we saw those, the results of how that worked. So we're probably going to use this every week. This is something I want to take a minute to poke around with. So this is the equivalent in so in Visual Studio, we had the NuGet package manager. In Node, we have the Node package manager. So basically what, when we install Node, it comes with a, a bunch of kind of base libraries. If I look in my folder where Node was installed. So when I install Node, this was the app, this is when you download and install it. It comes with this folder called Node modules. And inside of the NPM folder, and there's another node modules, all of these, or most of these, are modules that come, are libraries, they're called core modules. So when you install node, you get these support libraries automatically. Um, and in fact, I think we used this, we kind of used one called FS before for file system when we were reading the text files that we created. So these come with Node, but there's tons of other libraries out there. And for any website, any Node site, we can simply install a new library. So the site for this, we can poke around here, is npmjs.org. So we can download anything from this site just using the command line. So let's say, for example, well, I mean, here's Express. So we can go into any package, if I click on it, it gives us the command we need to run in the command prompt or terminal to install this package either globally on our system or if we just want to install it for one particular node application. So the command is always npm install and then it's just the name of the package. So we can actually see with all these packages, so Express is probably the most popular uh, 4 million downloads, 4.2 million downloads of this package in the last month. So typically we can see how many, how often it's being downloaded. We've got links to the documentation and almost everything that's on NPM JS is open source. So usually there is a link to the Git repository. Um, generally there is, yeah, here we go. So here's the Git. Okay, well, there's, they've moved it and haven't updated. Yeah, so here are all their repositories. So we can find packages for anything. Let's say we want, um, 
you know, we're looking, we want to do error handling. Well, here are, well, this is one for development only, but we've got a bunch of packages. So if we want to add this, so they give us documentation as to how we would use it in our node application. And at our command prompt, if we just run the command npm install error, it will add this package into our application. Okay. Yeah, it works some, sort of similar to Sublime, really. Um, so one of the things we'll want later on, let's say we want to, we want to format currency. Later we'll build a little tax calculator, but in Node it doesn't have any built-in formatting. So later on we'll install this accounting library because it'll allow us to format strings as currency. So we'll just run the command npm install accounting for that. So it always gives us the code we need to run right there. So what this will do when we build a node app and we install this, it will actually, within our application, node, um, when we start using NPM, when we run an install, it's going to create, so I have a lesson six folder, this is from last semester, it will create a node modules folder and any packages that I install with NPM, it automatically downloads all the source code into my application so my application can use this package. We don't need to modify this, this just makes the library available to us. In fact, this is a neat one called Mongoose. Uh, that's used for um, connecting, helping our node application talk to our MongoDB. It's a driver for MongoDB called Mongoose that we'll use. So if we want cookies, we'll install cookie parser, etc. So those things automatically get added. So we're going to use NPM uh, often. So think of it this way. It's a basically a registry to browse, download, and install. So if ever we think we want to add functionality, before we write the code, the first thing to do is go to the NPM website and do a search and see if there's already an existing NPM package that we might want to download and install. So later on when we do authentication, rather than write our own, we're going to use an a package called Passport. This is kind of the standard half a million downloads and installs in the last month. So this is the standard. If you grab the copy of the book I recommended, they use Passport for authentication. So we'll use this later on in the course after reading week. Okay, so using NPM is really simple, but basically it's all done through the command line. So we'll be using it right. We'll be using it regularly through the command line. Um, so all we need to run, so we've got a couple options. We can just say npm install. That will add the package into our current application. So if I make an application called server, I just go to my server directory in the command line and type npm install and I can add the name of a package. That installs it just for that one application. Or we also can install a package globally. The way we do that is we type npm install dash g for global and then the name of the package. So that means that package is available in any node application we build on our system. So if we like that package, we don't have to install it in separately every time. We can install it globally and then all of our node applications have access to it. Um, we can also do things like update versions. We can uninstall them. Simple commands like install, uninstall, update. Um, one of the other things that's going to happen is we typically install quite a few packages into our node application. So what NPN gives us is it will give us the option to create a JSON file that keeps track for any website of what all the packages are because we may have lots of them in there. So here's what one of those would look like. Just open it up in uh, Sublime. Okay. So when we use NPM, and there's actually a little wizard in the command line that auto generates this file for us. We don't have to create it ourselves, which is nice. NPM smart enough to do it. There's just a wizard where it prompts us to name our application, give it a version number. There's a prompt for the author's name if we want to put in our name. And then 
The dependencies, these are all of the NPM packages that our node application is using and also which version we have of each one. So we don't have to create this ourselves, but this file is handy because it keeps track of all this stuff for us. So, you know, this is kind of at its most basic. We get name, version, and the list of dependencies. So anytime we run the command npm install and we install a new package, it will automatically add it to this list of dependencies. We don't have to do it manually. So this kind of serves this package.json. In many ways, if you think of our web.config file in an ASP.NET application, it was a site configuration file. That's really what the package.json is going to do in a node application. Uh, the web.config does more. This is kind of like the light version. And we can initialize. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's play around with this. So if you want to open up a command prompt, actually, sorry, before, go into your node directory in uh, Windows Explorer or in Finder or my computer. Let's create a lesson three folder for today. And then I'm just going to run through my command prompt. I'm going to go into that directory. So I'm in my lesson three folder. So I'll, in my command prompt, I'll just browse into my new folder. If I run a dir command, or for the Mac users, run an ls command, we'll just have an empty directory here. So what we want to do, we can create that package JSON file ourselves if we want to, or we can use the command prompt to actually help us generate it in like a step-by-step -step process. So the way to do that, and this is in the slide, if we run the command npm init, it's like, so it's initializing it just like we ran git init last week. This will actually walk us through and create a package.json file for us. So I'll hit enter. So now it says, this utility will walk me through creating a package.json file. Okay. Um, so press, I can press C anytime to quit. So the first thing is it says, what name do you want for your application? In brackets, it's showing me it's going to name it lesson three as the default because that's the folder I'm in. So if I want to give my application a different name, I can. If I just hit enter, it'll just accept what's in brackets, lesson three. Version number defaults to 1.0.0. That's fine. Typically, if I do this, I'm just going to hit enter all the way through. Description, um, first app using NPM. Doesn't matter if you just hit enter, the description will be blank. Entry point. So this sometimes will change. What this means is when the application starts, what is the name of the first file that will be loaded? By default, index.js. We can just say yes to that. We'll change it later. Test command will ignore, so we'll just hit enter. Oh, this is neat. Do we, can we link it to a Git repository? If we do this, it will actually initialize Git in here. So before I hit enter, let's do this. I'm going to go up to GitHub. I'll create a Comp2106 Lesson 3 repo, and then we can paste the URL so it's actually connected to GitHub right away. Go to GitHub. You could do this through the your desktop client if you prefer. So I'll just call it Comp2106 Lesson 3. Starting with Node and NPM. I'm not going to create a README file. I just want a blank repository. You don't have to put in a description, just put in a name and click create.
And now if I just go over here, I get this screen. If I hit copy the clipboard, copy my Git URL or copy it out of the address bar, doesn't matter. Now for my Git repo, if I right click and paste, my application is already initializing Git locally and going to sync to that remote. So I'll hit enter here. Keywords. We don't have to put in keywords, but if we publish this application, then it will read that package.json file for keywords. Let's say we're making our own NPM package to put on NPMJS for other people could use. We could tag it with keywords. So you know, if, uh, if you wanted to make a calculator, then you could tag it as you know, math calculator. And when someone would search on NPMJS, it would include looking for those keywords. I'll just hit enter. We don't need the keywords. Author, you can leave a blank. You can put in your name. I'll put it in. Again, we could just hit enter through all of these if we want. We don't have to put change any of these values. What type of license do I want? So there's the different open source licensing. I'll just hit enter. So now it previews what the JSON file is going to look like. So it says I'm about to create package.json in lesson three. Here's how it's going to look. Are you OK with this? Yes or no? So I'll just hit enter for yes. And now npm has created package.json. So you certainly don't have to use npm in it. You can just, you could create package.json on your own, but why would you not do this? Like how this, you know, this is dead simple. So I'm going to open up my code editor. Slowly. So here's package.json. So we don't have to have a lot of these sections. Most of them are optional. The only things that we really need are the name version. And then if we start installing additional libraries, it will install dependencies. We'll have that dependencies section. So we can change any of this if we want. But as we use the package manager, we'll automatically update this file with whatever packages or references we've installed in our application. Or let's say we decide eventually, which we'll do later, we'll do in a bit, let's decide, say we don't want index.js to be our main, to be our startup page, we can change it here. We want to load default or something else, login, home, whatever we want that to be. In, right, so you might want to accept it as index. Like later on, I think when we deploy this, when we, if we deploy it to Azure, Azure wants the startup file to be called server.js. So later on, we might change our, whatever our startup page is and rename it to server because it won't run unless it's got to be called server if we run it on Azure. So using NPM is pretty Pretty simple. Um, so there's a bunch of common kind of core modules and we worked with one if I open my file from, where were we from uh, week one? Just open it with Sublime. Right, so we worked, the, this FS module, this one doesn't have to be installed separately from Package Manager, that's the file system module. That comes with Node. When you install Node, you automatically get that. And we said in week one that when we want to use any module, it doesn't matter if it's a core module or one we've downloaded and installed with Package Manager, we just use the require function, just like we did in PHP, just like we could do in PHP. So again, I'm going to go back to 
my example. So Katie's made a package. Katie's made a, you know, a package called Calculate that we want to use in our application. We would install it on the command line. We type npm install calculate. It would install that package, add it to our package.json. And then in any node file, if we wanted to reference it, we would just add in require calculate. And then we're using that library or that module. And we have access to all the functions, all the variables, all the code in, in that package. Um, okay. Just skip some of these. So some of the common core ones, we worked with the file system. We'll work with the, there's a built-in HTTP module. We'll need that one in order to be able to run web pages. So we'll use that one today. So let's try a couple really simple examples. Um, so let's make a new file in our Lesson 3 application. I'm going to make a new JavaScript file, and it's only appropriate, we'll call this one Hello World. <laughs> so how would we output a message? Anybody remember from the last couple weeks? We just want to spit a message out when this runs. Yeah, we'll use console.log. I'll save my file. So this is not a web application yet. This is just pure network communication using JavaScript. There's no HTTP, there's no request response. Now notice our package.json there's a couple ways I could run this. We could load our JavaScript file directly in the browser. So if I go back to my command prompt and I type node hello world.js, it runs. It logs it out. Now we can also use npm to launch the application, which is typically what we're going to do most weeks. If I want to try and run it from package manager, I'm going to try running the command npm start. Now, the reason Missing script start. So let's look. Um, okay, well, there's a couple of issues here. The first one is that we're looking for index.js and that doesn't exist. So let's try changing our package.json to load hello world.js instead. So, Kaylee, that comes to your question. Could we name it? We're probably going to have to do one other thing, but we'll try it like this. So I've just changed my line 5 where it says main. I change it from index.js to hello world.js. So now I'll try and run npm start again. Okay, still isn't happy. I think we're going to try one other thing before we can start it. Let's run the command npm install. Now we're not installing any particular package, we're basically kind of just starting package manager in this application. There's no way to like just know what it wants you to call it. Um, well, it doesn't care what you call it, it just has that file has to exist, okay. right? Originally, we called it, in, it was looking for a file called index because that's the default. But we didn't name our job, we don't have a file called index. So now I've run npm install. Let me go back to my folder now. Originally, there were two files in here, right? There was package.json and hello world. There were just those two files. But now that I've run the npm install command, Let's see if we can run npm start now. Uh, 
Okay. All right, let's create a new file. <laughs> we want to run it in the browser. What I want to do is get Hello World running in the browser. Okay. So we're going to try this file. Before we do, I'll explain what's going on. We're going to use the built-in package called HTTP. That will allow us to create. In effect, we're creating our own web server here. We're not using Apache. We're not using IIS. We're not using any other server. We're making our own. So we're going to use the HTTP library that comes with Node. And this library has a function called create server. This will start a web server running locally on our machine. Now, most of the functions, as we said over the last couple weeks, most of them use this asynchronous pattern, right? We talked last week about, over the last weeks, we talked about callback functions. I'll just pull up our file from last week as a quick review, uh, which I didn't seem to save. Where we do? Sorry, I have it on GitHub. Let's just look. We did an example last week with a couple different functions. Here it was. So here we wrote this function two ways. We wrote it the traditional way, where we gave our function a name, and then we called it. And then we tried the node style, the anonymous style, where our function has no name. We just assigned it to a variable. And we said, this is the style that node is going to use, where our functions have no name. And this allows, us, allows that function to run asynchronously and get called back when it finishes. So that's what we want to do here. We want to create our server. And you'll notice the two parameters that come in this anonymous function. What do you suppose req and res represent? What are those two values of an, with an HTTP server? And <laughs> request and response. So those are the two parameters oops, that this create server is going to use. We're going to send a header to the browser with a code of 200. What does 200 mean? That number's not picked at random. What is that number? Uh, good guess. Yeah, what, so I could do this, right? That would be another possible value here. So what does that code represent? It's the HTTP status code. Right? So what 200 is, is the HTTP status code for OK. The, H, the HTTP request is fine. If it was a not found, we'd want to send 404. And we can also send the type. In this case, it's just a plain request. You know, it could be text XML, text XML, it could be text JSON would be an option. If it, this is an API, rather than sending plain text, we're going to send JSON data. And then this response.end, this is like the equivalent of an echo or a console log, but to the browser. So this will print text. We could also use response.write, or we can use response.end for the last line. So this will send a message to the browser. What's happening here? Yeah, what port is our server going to run on? By, de by default in Node, we'll set the port to 3000. Our console is then going to print this message, server running at localhost colon 3000. And then if we go to this URL in the browser, we should get a web page that says, hello world. So not only are we, doing, are we printing out text, we're actually creating the whole HTTP server in this same function. So let's go ahead and do this. So I'll make a new file. I guess I can't really run my hello world file with npm, and I can't run it in the browser, which is OK. So I'm going to make a new JavaScript file. We'll call it server.js.
So the first thing we're going to do is link to nodes HTTP module. So I'll create a variable called HTTP So typically, whatever the module we're linking to, usually we just create a variable with the same name. <laughs> so start a local web server. So we're going to call create server. And we'll need a semicolon down at the end. And this is where we pass in our anonymous or our callback function. We're going to put in create a function that has no name, but that takes two parameters request and response. Just make sure I've got my brackets right. Sorry. Hang on. Should be this way. Sorry. There's our brackets. So we open a curly bracket, set of curly brackets, sorry, round bracket. So this structure is kind of new, but it'll become more familiar as we use it regularly. So we'll set the response code to OK. Whoops, it's, I used the wrong function. It's right head. So right head takes a couple of parameters when we call that function. The first value we can pass it as a response code. 200, 404, 500, 401. These are just standard HTTP status codes. The second thing we're going to pass in is some JSON format content type text plane. So after my 200, going to put in a comma and open a set of curly braces. So if we use the console or the inspect the JavaScript inspector in our browser, we'll be able to see this code. We can change, we'll, we'll send it and then we'll try changing it and we'll see where this actually shows up in the browser. So then we'll display a message and end the response. Now we can do this in one line of code or we can do it in two lines of code and they're equivalent. To do it in two lines of code, we can just call the response.write method, print out a message, and then call response.end. We also could do this in one line. Response.end also lets us, when we're ending the response, we can also send text then. So I'll show you the other way of doing it. Or we can just do response.end, hello world. So before we end, print this text and then end. So 15 and 16 is equivalent to line 18. Line 18 is shorter and more efficient. If we do it in two lines, it's just a little bit more clear what we're doing. So you can use either one of these. I'll just comment this one out and I'll make a note above 
or print and end in a single command. Or. So you can use either one of these. So it'll send headers to the browser with a status code, it'll send text to the browser and the response will end. Now we haven't done our callback part. So this is what should happen for processing the response part. This is what we want our server to do. But remember, we talked about this event loop in Node that the server's constantly listening and processing events on a certain thread. So this creates the server, but we haven't added the listener. So if I could try to run this right now, let's see what happens. So if I run Node, server.js we'll see what happens I'm not sure if I'm going to get an error so let me just open up a new browser and go to localhost 3000 so I'm trying to run that or if I go to server.js I guess Notice my server's not actively running yet. So we're, we've written the code for sending a response, but the server isn't listening. We haven't started that event listener yet. We haven't started that loop. So we've got to add something else here. And this is where our callback comes in. So we want to listen on port 3000. So we're basically chaining two functions together. What this means is create the server so our server will process responses whenever they get a request and then start listening. And also print a message to the command, command line. So server running at localhost 3000. So once this starts running, there should be a message printed in the command line. And what will happen when our node application, when our server starts running, the command line will actually be locked. So long as our application is running, you can't type additional commands in this command prompt because the server is actively running and listening so it won't let us do other things while it's running. So we're going to start listening, start our server and then handle any request that comes in and send this response. So let's try it again now. So now notice my console says my server's running and I can't type. I can't do anything else. So I can't like install a package or go do something else in this command prompt because my server's ru actually running. So now if we go to localhost 3000, it's listening for a request and every time a request comes in, it sends back this response. Let's look for a minute at what, what's happening here. Where does this show up? If I go to my if we go to the console, sorry, the network, I know it's hard to see. It should show us that response in here. So if I refresh it, so notice I get a status 200. So that's where that right head status is coming out. It's telling me 200 
for my request and that the content is text plain. So that's what we're sending back here. So we, if we want to send back text JSON instead, that's what's going to show up in the browser header. Okay. If I want to show up, send a 404, let me just change it. 404 and not found. Now I've saved my change. My server's still running. What's going to happen when I refresh? Will it say 200 and hello world? Or will it say 404 and not found? What do you think? Still giving me 200. Any idea why? I've saved my change. Yeah, it's still running the last version. So how do I actually stop this and restart it? If I hit Control C on Windows or Command C on a Mac, the server stops. It's still Control C. Okay. Thank you. Have your attention, please. At 9 a.m., the Deberry campus will be conducting a test of its lockdown.